This morning, we bring our third in a series on following Jesus in the days of his flesh. This morning, our subject is when Jesus went to a funeral. Man has found no way to make a funeral attractive and enjoyable. And may I say to you that he has tried desperately. If you should take the time of looking into the funeral customs of the tribes and nations of this world, you will see that man has made an effort to try to somehow or another relieve the pressure and the awfulness of death. Man has invented millions of gadgets to add to the comfort of living, but dying has not been made a pleasure. Man, even this morning after all of his vaunted knowledge, stands helpless in the presence of death. He tries to smother the heartbreak with soft music. He tries to cover the raw reality of death with beautiful flowers. But friends, pleasant surroundings, dignity, high-flown language, eulogies, panegyrics of praise cannot dull the sharp edge of a poignant grief. Even California undertakers and forest lawn have not been able to make a funeral a happy anticipation, and friends, they've tried also. It's only out here that undertakers will advertise and promise you a very wonderful funeral at a much reduced rate. And several years ago, Life magazine ran an article on a cemetery in this area that is world famous and headed it by calling it a happy cemetery. Well, it's not. I've been there too many times. Believers who speak today of a funeral service being a time of triumph and no place for tears, either they do not care or else they are putting up a false front. For God never asks us to be unfeeling and unmoved at a time like that. Paul did say, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. He did not say that we are to sorrow not. He said we are not to sorrow as those that have no hope. Of course we are to sorrow. There is something solemn, somber, sad, and sobering at a funeral. We do not go to a funeral for entertainment And it's not the way to spend a holiday. I know that there are a few today that have a morbid interest in attending a funeral, and a great many people like to hang around a cemetery. But that's not natural. Jesus went to a funeral. And when Jesus went to a funeral, it's recorded, Jesus wept. He was touched with the feeling of our infirmity. And since he was touched with the feeling of our infirmity and had our humanity, when he went to the cemetery, he wept. In spite of the fact that he intended to break up the funeral. And every time he went to a funeral, and when Jesus went to a funeral, he broke it up. He turned a funeral procession into a parade of joy. He turned sorrow into singing, weeping and wailing into laughter and shouting. The greatest miracles which he performed are when he raised the dead. Now, I know that there are those that would say that the miracles he performed are all on the same par because they're divine, and since they're divine and required an infinite God, they're of equal power. I'm not prepared to debate that type of reasoning. All I say again is that the greatest miracles which he performed was when he raised the dead. My friend, that is the real test of any religion. 
how does it deal with death? He said to his disciples when he sent them out on one occasion, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. It's been interesting today that a group of people have taken that first injunction, heal the sick, and they've majored on that. And we hear a great deal of faith healers, but you never yet have heard of a faith raiser. A faith raiser of the dead. And when they start doing that, I'll listen. For it all goes together. Heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers. Raise the dead. May I say to you that the supreme test of any religion is what does it do with death? And the pagan religions of the world, as you examine them today, always do one or two things. They treat death with fear. And it's an awful and frightful thing, or else they ignore it and dismiss it and dissipate it as Buddhism does, and saying you're just swallowed up in nirvana. Even liberalism today prattles pious platitudes at the time of death, and they say, we do not have a religion of the hereafter. We have a religion of the here and now. Why not both? The Christian faith has a great deal to say about the here and now. We agree to that. But may I say, friends, unless religion has an answer to the hereafter, it has no answer at all for the problems of life. Communism came along and began to ridicule Christianity, and they have a little parody. They sing pie in the sky by and by. May I say to you, what a travesty. Over yonder on Red Square this morning, there are the corpse of two dead men, Lenin and Stalin. They say... We don't believe in pie in the sky. We believe in pie right now. I'd like to ask Mr. Lennon and Mr. Stalin how much pie they're getting right now. May I say to you, what an awful mockery. If they are not getting pie in the sky, it's too bad for them. Because they're not getting it now. And there are those today that highly suspect that they are not getting pie in the sky. May I say to you this morning, the only answer that any religion or any philosophy of life that can give to an intelligent person down here is to answer the question of death. What do you do with it? What's your answer to it? What is your solution to it? Oh, I want something for the here and now. I want to know how to live now. But my beloved, there comes a day when we pass over. And what's your answer then? You'll be here just a few days, short days, and there is an eternity out there waiting. What's the answer? May I say to you that there are only three instances of Jesus raising the dead that are recorded in the Gospels. He alone has brought an answer into this world concerning death. He raised the dead, and personally I believe he raised more than three. If you turn over to the seventh chapter of Luke, the 22nd verse, you will find when John sent his disciples to make inquiry about Jesus, then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things you've seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. To the poor the gospel is preached. At that particular time, the Lord had only raised one from the dead, and that was the widow's son from the little town of Nain. 
And yet, he was to go back, the disciples to go back and tell John that the dead were being raised. I take it that he raised many others that are not recorded in the gospel, but we cannot speculate because we have no word or even any other suggestion than this in the Word of God. But there are three instances of Jesus raising the dead which are recorded, and these three are chosen with a great deal of care. These three are highly selective because they are given to us for a very definite purpose. I want you to notice these three very briefly this morning. For the Holy Spirit lifted out of the earthly ministry of our Lord just certain things. John in his gospel makes it very clear. Many other signs truly did Jesus, which are not written in this gospel, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. So that now these three the Holy Spirit selected for a definite purpose. Will you notice them briefly? The first was a little girl, 12 years of age. She is the daughter of Jairus. The second one was a young man, the Count we read in your hearing this morning. This young man was the only son of a widow, and he apparently is a man in twenties, probably, or thirties. Then we have the third given to us, and it's the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus was a man who was mature. We would call him today a senior citizen. Will you notice how carefully these three are chosen? First, there's a child, 12 years of age. Then there's a young man, youth. Then there's a man who's a senior citizen, all the way from junior to senior. They were chosen for a definite purpose. The other thing that's quite interesting about them is that the little girl had just died. She was still on her sick bed when Jesus entered the home and raised her from the dead. The young man, his body was in a funeral procession and they were carrying him out to bury him. Lazarus had already been four days inside the tomb. You see, they're chosen with a great deal of care. Youth, a child, maturity, senior. One just died, one is being buried, and the other has been dead in the grave. All chosen for a purpose. Now, I want you to notice, for I'm just going to draw this morning two lessons from these. The first is that the method that the Lord Jesus used in raising the dead was identical in each case. And that, my friend, is all important. He never deviated one iota from this method. He followed this pattern in each case. But in other miracles which he performed, he was not confined to one method. In the other miracles, he used a variety of methods. You'll find that that's recorded with a great deal of ease like that. Let's take an illustration. He opened the eyes of the blind. We have an instance of when he entered Jericho on the way to the cross, that there was a blind man sitting there and he just yelled at the top of his voice. And the people say, shush, don't worry the master, he's very busy. And our Lord heard him, he always hears. And he said, what does the fellow want? And he knew, of course, but he says, what does he want? He says, well, he's a blind man. 
And the Lord Jesus says, bring him to me. They brought him to him, and he said, what do you want? Well, he says, I'm blind. I want to see. And our Lord said to him, it'll be to you according to your faith. He never even touched him. I don't think he even got close to him because the crowd was there, and he spoke to him from where he was marching in, and the man was on the sideline. And immediately his eyes were open. That's one method. When he was in Capernaum, two blind men were brought to him. And we are told that they couldn't see. He reached forth and touched their eyes. And they were able to see. There's a third instance of the man born blind and our Lord made clay and anointed his eyes. And he told him, he says, you go down to the pool of Siloam and wash. Why did he do that? Couldn't he? Couldn't he have done what he did with the first one? He could have, but he didn't. He used different methods. I've often wondered if maybe those three men who had been blind got together afterward and started three different denominations. One of the men, the man there at Jericho, could very easily say, now, I want you brethren to understand that you don't have to be baptized. Not necessary. You don't need any water at all to be saved. And I could understand that the two blind men there from Capernaum would say, wait a minute, you're wrong. We happen to know that he has to touch you. You've got to be sprinkled. Don't tell us now, don't tell us that you don't have to be baptized. You've got to be sprinkled. And then there was another one there, Baptist. And he would say this, mm -hmm. both of you are wrong. You've got to go down in the water because that's the way I did it. He anointed my eyes and he said, go wash. And I went and got out in the pool of Siloam. And that's the way you brethren better do it or you won't see. You say that would be utterly ridiculous if they did that. It would be if they did it, but we've done it since then. We've argued about those things. And if those three men argued about that, I can well understand they'd not get together about the glorious person of Christ. And the blind man that was there at the entering in of Jericho to whom he just spoke, he would walk away singing, only believe, only believe. The two blind men would sing a duet as they left and they would sing the touch of his hand on mine. But the man born blind that went down and washed in the pool of Siloam, he would sing, Shall we gather at the river? May I say, friends, that's utterly preposterous. Certainly it's preposterous. But you see, he used different methods to open blind eyes. But he never deviated one iota from the identical method he used in raising the dead. And that method was always this. He spoke directly to the dead. He spoke as if they heard him. And friends, they did hear him. And he raised them from the dead. He made this statement. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. His method was to speak directly to them. Will you notice it? The little girl, this ruler, never came to ask Jesus to raise the dead. He came to ask him to come and heal his little sick daughter that was sick unto death. And he was in such a hurry. 
Now, Lord, seemed to tarry. There was the woman with the issue of blood, and he stopped, and he healed her. And while all this was going on, this poor ruler, standing on first one foot and then the other, saying, why doesn't he hurry? A servant slips through the crowd and comes up to him and said, you just well come home. Don't bother the master, father. She's dead. He starts to leave, and our Lord said, don't leave, just believe. I'll go with you. And he went with him, and they got to the house already. The paid mourners were there, and they were mourning and wailing. And our Lord said to them, she's not dead. The little girl's asleep. And they ridiculed him, and he said, put them out. And they put them out. And he took Peter, James, and John, the father and mother, and went in. And our translation is very stilted. He adopted the language, the Aramaic of that day, the language the little girl understood, and he said, Talitha, Shumi. And if you want the literal translation of it, he said to her, Little lamb, I say to you, wake up. And she waked up, and he gave a very practical suggestion. He said, she's hungry, you better feed her. And a 12-year-old girl would be hungry. And they fed her. He raised her from the dead, and he did it by speaking directly to her. He went out to the tomb of Lazarus. He deliberately stayed away while Lazarus was sick. He would not even come for the funeral. He didn't arrive until after this man had been in the grave four days, and the minute he arrives, Martha and Mary rebuke him and said, If you'd been here, our brother would not have died. And he said, Where have you buried him? And they said, Oh, no, not that. He's been buried four days. It's nothing in the world but putrefying flesh. He said, Where is he buried? He went out and he called him. Lazarus, come forward. He spoke directly to this man, and this man came forth from the tomb. I think the one that Dr. Luke records is one of the loveliest of all. It's a story of a young man, and he tells it with a great deal of pathos. This young man that died was the only son of a widow. And believe me, it was a loss for her. Because it not only meant that she lost the one who's most precious to her, and the only son of a widow would be a pretty precious boy. But it's very practical. He was her support also. And the town has turned out. They've had the funeral service. The preachers preached the funeral. They are now on the way out through the city, and they've come to the city gate, and the whole town has come because they're grieving with this poor widow. There comes the funeral procession, and you see the picture coming into the little town of Nain as Jesus and his disciples are following him, and we are told another great company. And... Let's get rid of the notion that he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and it means he was long-faced and went about long-faced all the time, for he did not. If you will read on in the 53rd of Isaiah, you will find out he had no sorrows of his own. He had no griefs of his own. He was bearing your sorrows and mine on the cross. He had none. He was the happy Christ. And when he was coming into the city, the crowds were following him. And my friend, it was like a picnic to go along with him. The crowd had been with him out yonder when he fed the 5,000. What fun it was to have spent a memorial day with him. What a picnic with him. And this crowd coming in are joyful, and that crowd coming out are sorrowful, and they meet and they clash. And our Lord sees the widow, not the boy, honestly. And I say it to you reverently this morning, it was no favor he conferred on that boy to restore him to life. 
And I don't know about you this morning, but after I've now passed the time of weeping, I do not want my dead brought back. Do you? No, sir, I do not. There's no, there is no favor being conferred on that boy. Our Lord saw the grief of that widow. His heart went out to her. And then he stepped over to the beer. The boy didn't even know him. He could have called him the name. He called Lazarus, but he just said to him, young man, so you and I know he was a young man. He said, young man, I say to you, Wake up. The young man came back. The dead heard his voice. Why did he raise the dead like this in every instance? Because that's merely a picture of what he's going to do, and he'll do it the same way. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. And in that shout, you'll hear your name and the name of every loved one that's in Christ. For he says, And the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And again he says, My sheep hear my voice. And one of these days, when he comes to take his own out of this world, he will also call each one by name that has died. That's what it means, I think, in Revelation when it says he has a voice that's like the sound of many waters. A voice in which you will hear your name if you have been buried and belong to him. You say, how will I hear and how will my loved one hear? They've been in the grave for years. That body's gone back into the dirt. Of course it has. What happens is the spirit has gone to be with him. And when he speaks, that spirit will answer and come with him and stand yonder where that body was buried. And that body will now come up a glorified body ever to be with the Lord. For we know that if the earthly house of this tabernacle, and that's all this little flesh of clay is today, be dissolved, we have a tabernacle, a home eternal in the heavens. And he'll bring that spirit someday, and that body will be raised. Marvel not at this, he says, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth they that have done good. And what does it mean to do good? This is the work of God that you believe on him whom he hath sent. And you can't do good without trusting Christ today. Those that have done good under the resurrection of life and they that have done evil under the resurrection of damnation or of judgment, if you please. May I move on now to the second and last great truth that comes out of these restorations to life. And listen very carefully. Technically speaking, none of these are resurrections. All of these are merely restorations to life. It's interesting that when Lazarus came forth from the grave, that John very carefully records it, he came forth bound hand and foot, and our Lord says, you've got to loose him. The poor man's all tied up. But when our Lord came back from the dead, John entered the new tomb, and he saw the linen clothes lying. They were not even disturbed. For our Lord had been raised in a glorified body and had come up out of those grave clothes. Lazarus had not. He'd been merely restored to life. I think that probably the tradition is accurate that says that Lazarus asked Jesus 
if he'd ever have to die again, and our Lord told him he would, and that from that day on he never smiled because he'd been through death once. And may I say to you, friends, it's true that the sting has been taken out of death. It's true that the grave gets no victory today for a believer. But it's not true that death is a pleasant experience. Death is still the same old enemy of man. And so he never smiled. Will you look at death for just a moment? Because our misunderstanding today of what resurrection really is is because we actually do not understand what death really is. Scripture speaks of death in a threefold manner. First of all, there is physical death, and that's all we understand by death. Physical death refers only to the body, and it means the separation of the spirit and soul from the body. I merely live in this body, and you merely live in your body. Actually, I have never seen you, and you've never seen me. You and I stand out on the corner, and you say to me, you look, you undergoes Mr. Jones, and we look across the street, and all we see is a suit of clothes with a head and two hands sticking out of it. And I say, sure enough, that's Mr. Jones. But we haven't seen him, because all we've seen is the tabernacle that he lives in. And he walks a certain way, he looks a certain way, and we know him because of that. But we do not know him, we've never seen him. Physical death means that the spirit has left the body, means separation of the spirit from the body, just moved out. And the spirit has gone for the believer immediately to be with Christ. Now, physical death has come to man because of Adam's sin. Because of Adam's sin, today death has come upon man. Paul says in Romans, the fifth chapter, the twelfth verse, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. It doesn't mean that men sin and then because of that they die, because little babies die that have never committed a sin. The reason they die and the reason you and I die is because Adam sinned. All of us sinned in Adam, and his sin brought death upon the entire human family. That was first of all physical death. Then, my friend, there is what is known as spiritual death. That is separation from and rebellion against God. You and I are born dead. We inherit a dead nature from Adam. When God said to Adam, In the day ye eat thereof, ye shall surely die. Now, he did not die physically that day. In fact, a millennium almost went by before he died physically. But he died spiritually. Because that very day he ran from the presence of God. He's in rebellion against God. He hates God. So when Paul, writing to the Ephesians, and if you please, writing to you and to me, he says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. And the day... The gospel is being sent out to those that are spiritually dead. A very wonderful preacher in the East years ago was riding out to the cemetery with the undertaker after the funeral service, and he tried to witness to the undertaker, and the undertaker didn't seem to be interested at all. He was dead in trespasses and sin. And so this preacher said to him, says, Did you ever read the undertaker's verse in the Bible? The man says, Undertaker's verse? I never heard of an undertaker's verse. Oh, he said, yes. He says it's over in Matthew, the 8th chapter, the 22nd verse. But Jesus said unto him, Follow me and let the dead bury their dead. And this undertaker said to him, he says, That's silly. How can dead people bury dead people? He said, do you know you're getting ready to do the impossibility? 
You are spiritually dead and you're going to bury a man that's physically dead. The dead bury the dead. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. I'm the most hopeless person in the world in this pulpit today because if there's anybody here unsaved today, you are dead in trespasses and sins and it's rather silly, isn't it, to go out to a cemetery and say, ladies and gentlemen, I want to speak to you. And yet I'm speaking to you. If you're listening in today, if you're here today and you've not accepted Christ, you're dead in trespasses and sins. And I want to be honest with you, I wouldn't have come out here to stand in a pulpit made famous by Dr. Tarry if it were not for the fact that I happen to know that the Holy Spirit is here. And the Holy Spirit makes this impotent, powerless preacher all-powerful because he still can open dead ears to hear. For the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. And I have every confidence that there will be some listening in or here today, dead, who will actually hear. There was a head of a cult a few years ago that went about over America and Canada giving a message on the subject, millions now living will never die. A very famous preacher in Canada followed him around for a while and hit the subject of his message was, millions now living are already dead. And friends, that happened to be lots more accurate than the other statement. Millions now living are already dead, dead in trespasses and sin. Spiritual death, if you please. And when you and I come to Jesus Christ, that's the reason our Lord said even to a religious man, ye must be born again, you must be regenerated because you are dead in trespasses and sins and religion can't change that fact. Only Christ can. By men coming and trusting Christ and when they do, the Holy Spirit regenerates them, makes them alive now to God. That's spiritual death. The third and last is eternal death. And that's eternal separation from God. Will you listen to me now very carefully as we begin to close the message of the morning? Let me give you these two verses again. John 5, 28 and 29. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. Some shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation or to judgment. They are raised from the dead to stand before the great white throne, if you please. They are raised to stand before that great white throne where no one is saved. The judgment of those who have rejected Jesus Christ, whose names are not in the Lamb's book of life, and if their name is not there, they are lost. Why? Because they're already dead, my beloved. And God's not taking dead men to heaven. He's taking live men. In the picture that's given in the 20th chapter of Revelation, the 13th verse, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and the grave delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works, and death and the grave were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. That's eternal death. Then he says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Men born spiritually dead will not hear the voice of the Son of God, but if they'll hear his voice, the Scripture's very careful to say this, that up to this morning, friends, 
There's only one person who's actually been resurrected from the dead. Lazarus died again. The little girl probably grew up to womanhood and married and had a family, but she died. The young man, the widow's son, he probably one day went to his own mother's funeral, but there came a day when they went again to his funeral. But when Jesus Christ was buried and came back from the dead, nobody goes to his funeral. He ever lived. And he is alive today, who only hath immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Paul, again writing to this same young preacher, Timothy, said to him in the second epistle, the first chapter, the tenth verse, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death. There will be no second death. There will be no eternal death. But those that are his own, he hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, if you please. We are told today concerning these bodies and resurrection only refers to the body. The spirits of men never die in the sense they cease to exist. Whether you are lost or saved, you're going somewhere. But resurrection refers to the body. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 44, it's sown a natural body, it's raised a spiritual body. And years ago, Dr. Cursop Lake, the liberal in Yale Divinity School, began to emphasize this verse and say, you see, the resurrection is spiritual. It has nothing to do with the body. It says it's raised a spiritual body. And Dr. Robinson, who was equally as great a scholar as he was, he said to him, Dr. Lake, you know Greek grammar well enough to know that a noun is stronger than an adjective, and that the noun that's carried over is body. It's sown a natural body, it's raised a spiritual body. The one thing that's carried over in resurrection is the body. The natural body is this body of death that we have today, a body that we got from Adam a body that is spiritually dead, and because of that, we'll lie physically dead someday if the Lord tarry. But our Lord came and brought life and immortality to life through the gospel by taking our place and bearing the penalty for our sins. He's come back raised from the dead, if you please, in a glorified body and now being Joined to him, this body of ours is sown a natural body, but one of these days it will be raised a body dominated by the Spirit of God and controlled by him. I don't know about you, I'll be glad to get rid of this one and get the new one. Oh, don't misunderstand me, I'm not morbid, I've done pretty well with the one I got. But it's already beginning to show signs of wet and tear. And one of these days we'll have to put it aside. And if you should happen to want to shed a tear, it'll be all right, but I hope you'll rejoice and look down and say, well, he got rid of that old nature. And now he's looking forward to a body, a spiritual body dominated by the Holy Spirit of God. I say to you this morning in closing, you can become sentimental at death all you want to, but my friend, today when you leave this world, you'll go to one or two places. You'll either go to his presence or you go to that place where you will be raised from the dead in order to be judged at that great white throne, and you will make your decision right here in this life. You may make it today, I do not know. And you can make it either way, by the way. And it'll be up to you. Years ago here in California, in the early days, 
a man with a very large family, lay dying. His children had been called from the four corners of this country. All of them was a Christian but one of the boys, that was the youngest boy. And they all came and gathered around the bedside of this father as he was dying. And the father tried again and again to bring that youngest boy to Christ, and he would not come. The others had, were living creditable Christian lives in other communities. And he began with the oldest, and as he came by, he'd shake hands with him, and he'd say to him, I'll see you soon. And he'd shake hands with the next one, the daughter, and he'd say to her, I'll see you tomorrow. And down the line he went and he came to that youngest boy and he looked at him for a moment and tears came into his eyes. And he said, son, goodbye. The boy broke down and he said, dad, why do you say goodbye to me? He says, son, I'll never see you again. If you continue to reject Jesus Christ as you've been rejecting him, you are going into a lost eternity. Spiritually dead, into an eternal death, separation from God. The boy listened for a moment, dropped to his knees, broke down and sobbed, and he said, Dad, don't tell me goodbye. I'll take Christ, and I'll see you tomorrow. May I say to you this morning, friends, on this memorial day when people become sentimental about the dead, they are in one or two places today. Those that are in Christ are waiting for that resurrection to hear his voice. Those that are lost, are waiting for that awful day when they'll be raised for judgment. What about you today? You're going one direction. Shall we pray? With our heads bowed this morning, briefly right where you're sitting, you can determine the destiny of your eternal soul. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth in him. Scripture is clear. No mincing of words, no beating around the bush. Either this morning you are saved in Christ, not because of your goodness, but because you've trusted him. Or this morning you are absolutely lost out of Christ. And right where you are sitting, you know the destination of your eternal self. Listening in today, and those of you here, may I say to you on a weekend in which America thinks of its dead, will you think upon the dead and think upon life today? And while you this morning still draw breath, you have an opportunity to make a decision. But be assured of this, you will have to make a decision.